All right, guys. Bang, bang. I've got Jed here. Thank you so much for doing this, sir. Yeah, thanks for having me. For sure. Let's just get started with your background. You've got this kind of very extensive technology-driven uh, background. Where did you get started in the business and technology world, and how do we eventually get to uh, Stellar? Yeah, uh, I mean, I've been programming for a really long time, probably since you know third or fourth grade. Uh, yeah, and um, uh, I've always been interested in kind of like distributed systems. Like the, the, the first kind of successful thing I did was this program called eDonkey 2000, which was sort of like BitTorrent. Uh, it was like a file sharing thing, um, this peer-to-peer -peer network um, that was pretty popular in like 2000, around there, 2001. Um, and then kind of after that was winding down, um, you know, I, I, I was like working on some other project and then I came across Bitcoin and got super excited about it. So got really into crypto because it was kind of in line with stuff I've already was working on and, and uh, you know, my general ethos. So. Got it. And do you remember the first time that you ever heard about Bitcoin or, or like what your thought was when you saw it? Yeah, uh, it was summer of 2010. Uh, there was like the first article, like there was a, a Slashdot article about it and um, you know, I, I haven't, even, I haven't even read Slashdot in years, uh, but, but I was just kind of looking for another project and, and kind of like looking around and I came across it and I was like, uh, really surprised that somebody had, was able to solve this problem because it, it didn't seem possible before, before I learned about Bitcoin. I think a lot of people had a similar reaction, um, and got super excited about it. And, and that's kind of all I thought about for the next, you know, well, really years, but, <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, definitely, definitely there's like few, like that month after, which that's sort of all I kind of think working on but and where does mount gox come from because you basically acquired mount gox i think the url but it was really for magic cards like tell us that story oh yes yeah. so, so i i had so basically i i read about bitcoin in like you know summer of 2010 uh kind of immediately i was like well i gotta want to play around with this i want to buy some of these things and there wasn't really a good way to do that at the time so then uh, i just said okay fine i'll just build a, an exchange like it was pretty clear that it needed that kind of thing um, and, uh, built that over the course of like two weeks. Uh, and I, you know, this is so early in, in Bitcoin's history. It was like very, there was like maybe 2000 people on Bitcoin talk, which is like the ex extent of people that knew about it at all. So it was just very unclear what it was going to happen with it or what it was going to do. So I, I didn't want to like, I, I, so I had a domain sitting around this Mount Gox domain, which I had used for a project years ago and it was just kind of idle. So I was like, okay, fine, let's call it this and, and, and do this thing. Um, so that's where the name came from and, and, and how that came together. Got it. And so when you're building, you know, kind of the exchange, you're looking at Bitcoin, you can't stop thinking about it. What was your thought process? Was it like, hey, maybe this thing grows into, you know, a couple million dollars of volume? Or was it like, this is going to be the next global reserve currency? Like kind of how bullish were you or, or what was your thought process at the time? Um, so I thought like, I thought it was an awesome idea and would have loved to see it like take off into the world and like be huge. It, it seemed kind of like a, a long shot that that would happen just because it was so small and like, the 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 idea of like the audacity of like saying hey we're going to make this new currency that everyone's going to adopt over the world is pretty huge right and so so uh you know i thought and it, you know these things only kind of worked to the extent that other people kind of buy into them and like then like also agree that this would be a cool thing and it just seemed like it was one going to be like this kind of niche internet thing that maybe it would grow over like years and years but i had no idea it would grow this quickly right so um uh, I, although I wanted it to, but, but, but it just seemed like it would take a lot longer for people to kind of wrap their heads around it, understand that this is a good concept. Like there was obviously like this group of people that, that kind of got it and understood why the world needed this like alternative to fiat currency. But, but it, it was just unclear to me that that was as widespread as it actually turned out to be. Right. So, so, uh, I, I think me and I think, I think most people like were hopeful, but, but kind of like cautiously optimistic, I guess, like they just thought this would take a lot longer and, and, you know, it, it was, you know, uh, it, it was, it was cool to see like how, how fast it got adopted like widely. So. Absolutely. And so basically you end up selling Mt. Gox, um, Ripple, Stellar, kind of, how do we get to, from Mt. Gox to, uh, Stellar? Yeah. So, um, like I said, I, I kind of just did, I kind of made Mt. Gox just to learn Bitcoin essentially, just like play around with it. And, and you know, I it wanted it was something that the ecosystem clearly needed and it would be a cool project to have, but, but I never really intended to run it long-term. So like, as it kind of started to get traction, I realized it was starting to take up more and more of my time. Like, it's not something that I really wanted to think about all the time. Like it's, it's, you know, it's not, uh, it's not like, well, I mean, I just generally like to work on like harder, like, um, you know, problems, I guess. So, so yeah, so I sold it to that guy in Japan, unfortunately, who ended up being pretty incompetent. 
and you know that you guys can all look up that history if you don't already know. But um, uh, and then I was thinking about other like basically I, I've always thought Bitcoin is this awesome idea, but I was kind of bothered by the the mining aspect of it. Like it's it uses obviously it uses like a ton of resources, and if there's a way to solve this consensus problem without doing that, uh, it would be it would be great, right? So I kind of like started thinking about other ways to like solve like the double spin problem, which is what mining in Bitcoin does is, is like solve this consensus issue um, and came up with the idea that kind of led to Ripple. So um, <clears throat> so I moved to California and with the intention of like starting Ripple and and like, you know, found some people to work on it with me. Uh, you know, we were working on it for a while then I brought in uh, someone to be CEO. And then that ended up, we ended up not seeing eye to eye and there was like some drama there. And so I eventually left Ripple with the intent of kind of just doing something else entirely. Uh, but the the original idea and premise and like the, the reason why I wanted to do Ripple in the first place or like what liked crypto in the first place was still there and it was like kind of hard to get away from. And so then I, I set up Stellar with kind of like the intent to just kind of make this network the way that, that, that uh, I think is most beneficial for the world. So yeah. got it. So let's start with just kind of a 101 of what is Stellar? How does it work? And, and when you describe it to people who know nothing about, you know, cryptocurrencies or anything like, like what's that right. uh, description? Yeah. So, um, well, so the basic problem that we're trying to solve is if, if you know anything about uh, like the financial infrastructure today, the way the way money moves around the planet, it's very much pre-internet, right? There's all these different financial networks. You know, there's like uh, you know ACH and and SEPA and SWIFT and like mobile money things and you know M-Pesa and all these kind of things, and and they don't interoperate, right? They 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 all have their different standards, and and if you want to send money from PayPal to you know, some mobile money thing in, in Southeast Asia, you just can't do it, right? They, they're just not, they just don't communicate. Uh, and this is all, this situation is like very much like the way that the, the way the world was before the internet. And and uh, the idea behind by Stellar is just how do you be, make this interoperable layer where all these things can communicate with each other, right? So not just in different financial networks, but different currencies, right? So if you're holding, you know, pesos in Mexico and you want to send, you know, $5 to somebody and, and like, uh, you know, Italy, like th that's really not even possible today, right? In, in any affordable way, right? So, so uh, Stellar is a way to to do that, right? It just it just allows you to use any currency at any financial institution and seamlessly and effortlessly send to anybody else in the world, right? So that's that's kind of the goal, and the way we do that is by leveraging this this uh, innovation that that Bitcoin uh, came up with, which is is like this distributed ledger that everyone can see but no one can change arbitrarily, right? There's like certain rules that have to be followed and there's this consensus mechanism that 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 is adhered to and then uh, and this ledger is updated over time, right? And so the, the beauty of that is that there's no um, central party. I mean, maybe your listeners all party know all this stuff, but 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 there's no there's no person that you have to like uh, absolutely trust. Uh, so like if you have two financial institutions that don't necessarily know each other, now they can go through this distributed ledger uh, to, to be able to transact, even though they, they maybe not trust each other and maybe just don't have a formal relationship with each other. Uh, and it's, so it's, it's kind of the, the, like the core, like blockchain idea is what kind of unlocks this ability to be able to make this, this internet level protocol for, for payments. Right. And so, so that's what seller is. So like basically to, to be kind of less abstract about it. So it, what it allows you to do is hold any kind of currency. You can hold like dollars, euros, you know, Bitcoin, anything, any, anything you want can be tokenized onto the network. Uh, and it's sort of, you know, uh, you know, Stellar was launched, uh, like, I think over six years ago now, or maybe about six years ago. Um, and then that was like the premise of the idea. And like, now we're kind of seeing that with all these like stable coins, like people have kind of got the point that, that it's useful to have, um, you know, representations of, of money that you're used to using in these same digital networks, right? You want to be able to have your you know, US dollars operate with your Ethereum, operate with your like yen or whatever. Like these things all need to kind of be in the same ecosystem. Uh, and that unlocks all this kind of uh, power, right? And so that's the idea behind sellers that you can represent any kind of value and you can trade this value amongst each other. So it's almost like what you're doing is you're basically making the uh, technology interoperable. And then where the competition plays out is at like the monetary policy layer, let's say for currencies, right? Is the differentiation is no longer in like, hey, I have dollars in my wallet. I have to physically go to like a currency exchange or at the airport to exchange it for some other currency. Now I just, everything's interoperable, click of a button, I can move in, in between these, reduce the friction. But at that monetary policy layer, there's obviously differences. And so I can make my decisions based on non-technological barriers to some degree. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, you could imagine a world where, 
you know, it's not even currency, but maybe like, you know, if regulations start to allow, it's like you could have like shares of Apple or shares of stock. And then like when you go to spend, they just get seamlessly converted into whatever, right? So, you know, like it allows you to just do very different things than what, what's done today and gives people like a lot more flexibility. Uh, like right now, we're, we're one of the things, one of the big things we're working on is this uh, dollar savings project where it's basically like a mobile uh, consumer app uh, and it allows people in, in places with really high inflation, like say Argentina, to be able to save their money in dollars, right? And so that 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 that's like this really awesome use of this technology that that wasn't really possible before. So so uh, things like that are just like super exciting to us. Got it. And so basically, like, how's it going, right? Like, how do you think about the uh, adoption, kind of the development and evolution of Stellar to where we are today? Is this going well? Going better than you expected? Not going so well? How do you kind yeah. of measure that? Sure. Yeah. I mean, it's going really well. I mean, it's a, it's a really hard problem. And I think we see this with all throughout all of crypto is that, you know, there's a lot of interest and a lot of hype around it and a lot of people like it, but if, when you go and look like how are people actually using this in the real world, that's pretty still very nascent, right? There's still not a lot of like, you know, you don't have like a million users using it every day for like actual transactions, things like that. Right. And, and I think it's because uh, all of these things depend really heavily on network effects. Like you need lots of people in the world, to be kind of on board before they're useful, right? So particularly something like, like Stellar where it's all about payments, right? So if, if you can only pay to a certain number of people in the world, then your payment system isn't that useful. So, so you kind of have to get over this network effect hurdle and, and, and that's what's kind of made it take so long for I think all of crypto in general, right? So, um, but, but where we are now is, uh, you know, we have a pretty good uh, idea and route for like how to like get a beachhead into these network effects, how to make things useful for people uh, before there is a big network and so that's the main thing we're working on we've seen we've seen adoption go up quite a bit over the last year like this, this has been a really big year for us uh the team has grown a lot uh you know i think uh you know there's more more accounts on the network there's way more transactions we've had i i think i don't forget what the stats are but i think like 90 percent of our operations over the lifetime of history have been in this last year like it's just the popularity is just increasing uh, like quite a bit um so, uh, but so, so all those things, things are going great. I mean, I think there's still, obviously we're not done. There's still a lot of work to do, but, uh, but yeah, we're definitely in the right track. So. Got it. And how do you look at yourself and kind of all these other smart contract platforms, you, you know, mentioned stable coins earlier, let's take Ethereum, for example, there's lots of activity there. Is yeah. this a world where there's coexistence, uh, kind of at the end? Is it, there's gotta be a winner take all just, how do you look at I don't know, competitive landscape or just other sure. platforms that people can use? Yeah. So, I mean, I think in general, most, a lot of these, you know, it, crypto all kind of gets lumped into this one bucket, but, but it's, I don't, I don't think it's like winner take all at all. Like, I mean, I think it's probably winner take all in like certain niches, but, but these things are all solving very different problems. Like the problem Bitcoin is solving is very different than what Ethereum is solving, which is very different than what Stellar is solving. Right. So like, like Ethereum is basically like this kind of, uh, you know, generic universal like computation thing, uh, that, that isn't, isn't, tailored for payments specifically, and you are obviously using it for that. Whereas Stellar is, is designed to fill this like very kind of narrow niche. I mean, it's not narrow because everyone sends payments, but, but, it, but it's, it's a specific one, right? So it's like, it's, it's uh, I, like definitely in the future, multiple of these things will exist. Uh, I think, I think the hope is that Stellar will be very good for like cross border payments and like sending, you know, representing other kinds of uh, value. Like, if, like the whole stable point thing works way, way better on Stellar just because it's designed to do that. Um, whereas Ethereum would be like, you know, like you're never going to make like a prediction market on Stellar, right? Whereas you can do that on Ethereum, right? There's, there's just different things that they could be done on different platforms. Got it. And so when we kind of fast forward here, we say, okay, uh, we're basically giving people the tools to build all kinds of stuff that they want to build. Um, and you're really focused, I think, on making sure those tools work and and, uh, and operate correctly. How do you think about where we're headed, right? You know, 10 years from now, is this a world where every stock bond currency commodity is digitized and, and it's on these networks and like, it's kind of the, you know, Bitcoinization of the world and tokenization of the world? Uh, or is it something that maybe isn't as audacious in, in terms of, uh, you know, kind of that final state or, or next decade or so? Yeah. Um, so, I mean, I do think like, uh, yeah, that most things will have like some digital representation. I mean, it just makes, it just makes so much more sense and it's easier. And like, you know, if, if you've ever send payments with cryptocurrency, you know, pay for something online, then you have to go use a credit card. It's just so annoying. You have to enter all the details and all this kind of stuff. Like it's just so much nicer. Right. So, so I, I, I do think that, that, uh, 
that it, we're going to move that direction. And, um, you know, I think, uh, there is some limit to it and, and there will still like people it, like the general, like population probably doesn't want to deal with their own secret key and it's probably not safe for them to think like that. So there will have to be like solutions around that, that'll end up looking, uh, not that different than what we have. Like, so, you know, there'll probably be things like a global Venmo, things like that, but, 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 uh, but the user experience will be very similar to what they're used to now. It'll just be, it'll just have more capabilities than, than, than what they can do today. Right. And so I think all of that is, it's really good, but, but, um, but yeah, I mean, I think, I think it will be, um, it, we're still a long way to go, like I said, for, for it to be like, where there's like millions of people using crypto every day for, for their everyday lives. But, but uh, I, I think we will get there in the next years. And what do you think the response from the incumbents are, right? So like basically what you're building, what, you know, folks are building with stable coins on Ethereum, what Bitcoin is being built, everyone is kind of under attack if you're an incumbent from uh, all of these technological uh, upstarts or, or really yeah. challengers, right? And so uh, put aside for a second who wins, who doesn't win, you know, kind of how, how it plays out from the challenger side. Just if you're an incumbent, you've got to feel like, you know, the technology industry is coming for us. What do you think is kind of the rational response from them? And is it something where, you know, some of them adopt and or uh, adapt and end up surviving uh, while some die? Or are we looking at potentially like a full blown disruption of the entire industry and, and basically none of them can keep up and, and right. there's entirely new players? Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> I mean, anytime there's like some large techno technological change, there there is this, you know, there are some companies that can handle it. There's some that can't, right? Like, you know, even if you look at like, the internet coming along, you know, now that there used to be tons of bookstores, now there's just Amazon, right? So like, uh, you know, I think, I think it'll be some, something in between, uh, just like, you know, in 10 years, there's, we won't, we won't, like none of the companies today will be around or anything like that. But I think, I think some of them will adapt. And like, you see that already, like you see like, you know, like PayPal is now accepting Bitcoin, like Square is obviously very like crypto forward, things like this. So, so some companies are, are, are realizing that this is the way that things are going to be in the future and, and they're moving that direction. Uh, so I, I, I think, you know, and some are just moving much more slowly, but, but, uh, but, I, but I think it is inevitable. And, and just like any big change, like there's going to be, like, there's going to be some people that get it and there's just going to be some that, 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 that don't. Right. So, um, you know, I mean like PayPal, for instance, they, uh, they banned, like I used to take PayPal on Mount Gox and they like, they banned me for life for having a PayPal account and now they're, they're accepting Bitcoin. So, so I don't know, they've obviously have changed some, some point in the reading 10 years. So. But, are, uh, are, you, are you trying to uh, get your account back or is, is that a focus of yours? Uh, no, not really. I don't need a PayPal account at this point. <laughs> <laughs> I've got Bitcoin, so. Absolutely. And, and so when you think about kind of the, the world as we're evolving here, um, a lot of times I just think about like where you spend your time and obviously you're spending majority, if not all of your time on stellar. What do you think about some of the other things that are going on? Is this a world where you're like, Hey, look, you know, Bitcoin stellar and then tokenization of assets or like, how do you kind of just think about the things that you're personally interested in and where you spend your time? Yeah. I mean, obviously there's just a ton going on in, in crypto space in general. And it's just very hard to like keep track of it all. And, you know, frankly, I, I don't spend that much time thinking about projects outside of stellar. Like, I mean, there's, there's so much to do with, with the stellar network that, that, uh, that, that just kind of takes up all my, all my bandwidth. I mean, there's, uh, so yeah. So, I mean, I think, I think the things that are interesting for me are just again, this idea that, 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 uh, the world needs this interoperable layer between all these things and like how do we make that possible and, and how do you bootstrap that network and that that's mainly what i spend time thinking about and just and kind of some stuff about like how like once you once you start to get scale like how do you make these networks um go much further than they can today because you know they're uh all of these things have pretty bad scaling properties if you compare them to just like a you know a database that you can like shard and all this kind of stuff so you, you have to come up with like methods for like how this is going to work long term. And so that's, that's what we're spending a lot of time doing now is like, you know, like what, like, what, like, how does this work in the wind condition? Like, I mean, how, how do you actually get like millions and millions of people on these networks? So, um, yeah, so we have some ideas around that. that that's what we're spending a lot of time on. Got it. Uh, there was recently this new piece of legislation that was put forward called the Stable Act, um, and it essentially, you know, a very broad generalization says you can't create a stable coin unless you've got a federal bank charter, right, for all intents and purposes. Um, and 
there's a lot of controversy around this. It feels like, you know, some people in the political sphere uh, think this is a, the greatest idea ever and they're going to, you know, work diligently to get it approved. There's a lot of people, I think, in the crypto community that say this is way off base and kind of exposes their lack of understanding of a lot of this. How do you think about it and, and kind of is there anything that you guys are doing from Stellar? I saw you guys put out an announcement or just kind of a statement. Just just talk through that piece of legislation. Sure. Yeah. Um, yeah, we put out a blog post about it that kind of goes into it. I mean, I, I, I appreciate the uh, idea behind it. I, I, what I assume is the idea is that they want to like, uh, you know, protect consumers from, from like, you know, losing all their money. Right. Which is, you know, which is something that obviously needs to happen. But, but I mean, this, this particular piece of legislation seems uh, like, like poorly crafted. I mean, it seems like it would ban things like, like Venmo originally. I mean, that's a digital currency that, that, that wasn't a bank. I mean, I think PayPal's a bank now, but, but originally when Venmo started, you know, that would have been disallowed. Right. And, and that's just like terrible for innovation. And it all just, let you do is just have these these people that are banks these old uh, that they there's it, there's no motivation for them to improve their situation for consumers like like the consumers ultimately will hurt by that because like there's not new innovation and 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 they just become like these like kind of calcified dinosaurs and there's no there's no there's nothing that they're competing against which which is like what drives all of this improvement for for consumers right so uh, it just seems like a very bad approach uh, to me. Yeah. And to me, what was so interesting about when they, you know, announced the legislation uh, or the proposed legislation was basically saying like, hey, we're doing this for financial inclusion. Like the banks have always preyed on everybody. So instead of allowing uh, kind of free market competition and innovation to take hold, we're basically going to just put a bunch of bureaucracy and, and regulatory right. hurdles in the way, which seemed counter to the position yeah. they were taking. Yeah, for sure. I don't see how this would help financial inclusion at all. I mean, like all of that stuff is going to be done by someone who actually cares about the problem and is not a bank and, and wants and needs some token that it can, you know, send around to these people. And, and, and that's just, this just prohibits that. So, yeah. Yeah. And how do you think about crypto in light of financial inclusion? Right? I think it's much easier to kind of understand it in the most extreme cases where people have no access to banking in some third world country and like, hey, now with an internet connection, but just maybe in the more developed world, like where do you see that happening? Is it affecting uh, a certain portion of the population, like, you know, the bottom 50% of Americans? Uh, is it something where, nope, this is going to be pervasive and everybody, regardless of socioeconomic status, are going to end up using this stuff? Just, just talk through that financial inclusion component and kind of where you see a lot of this technology fitting. Sure. Yeah. I mean, we've spent a lot of time working uh, on financial inclusion at, at SDF. Um, I mean, that was kind of our one of our original thrusts. And like, you know, we've always thought that this is going to take off in the developing world much more quicker than the, than the developed world, just because, uh, you know, because the financial infrastructure is just so much weaker there, right? And, and there's it's in the same way that like you know, cell phone adoption happened first or like much quicker in like places like Philippines and Indonesia where people didn't have landlines already. Right. So you can kind of just leapfrog it if you're not, if you're not beholden to the old system. And, but I think, I think crypto and like definitely stellar uh, just help the financial inclusion story tremendously because they make, they make it where uh, they just reduce, uh, take out a lot of friction from the system. Uh, one of the things that was like kind of causing financial like exclusion, I guess before is because it was just very expensive for banks to actually like, serve these people right so like if, if they couldn't make a certain amount per customer then it just it just wasn't feasible for them to do it because uh because it, you know their systems were just like old and cumbersome and it was actually expensive for them to to help these people whereas you know if you, if you have like uh you know if you have like like some mobile wall that's built on something like stellar you can have some digital dollar in there and, it, and you can pay people and you can you know you can have it connected to like you know, like savings and, and like interest bearing things, stuff like that. Right. And all that becomes essentially like this very lightweight bank account. And it's like super cheap to service and, uh, you know, can, can, uh, you know, connect people to the wider financial world, which is what you want to do to like financially include people. So ultimately it should be very beneficial for people, not just in like, you know, places like Nigeria, but like places in the U S as well. Right. So uh, that, that's, um, and is the thought process that eventually, you know, take an average uh, consumer, whether they're in the United States or, or a developing uh, country, the, all of their interaction with the financial system will be done through algorithms and networks and kind of decentralized type applications? Uh, or do you think that there still will be this like coexistence hybrid world where uh, maybe I have a traditional bank account at a centralized entity, but then I also use some of these other uh, pieces of technology to earn more interest or, or kind of, you know, send money at remittances or, or whatever it is. Yeah. I mean, I think, it, I think it will be some sort of hybrid. I mean, like I was saying before, it's like, I, I think it'll be, 
I don't think people ever get to the point where they want to secure or people in general want to secure their own private key. So you always need some institution that's essentially acting like a custodian or at least like, like facilitating you like it, it, with these things. Right. And so, and then there's also stuff where like for the stable coin model to work, like usually somebody has to like hold the deposits. Right. And so, you know, if you want interest on things, like somebody has to be like, well, like originating these loans and all that kind of thing. So there's, there's still a lot of like places where, traditional financial players need to kind of be in the ecosystem. I, I think what things like like Stellar and Crypto do is just make it where it's just much more flexible. It makes it where it's like a much more even playing field uh, where, where uh, you know, there's just less gatekeepers to the system. Like if, 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 if you're a new entrant, like say like someone sets up like a new like user first bank, like they can, they can easily compete with these like old banks uh, even though they don't have new customers because they're kind of on the same uh, infrastructure, like the same, like, meaning like the, the, the cryptocurrency like layer, right? So, so uh, because it makes everything interoperable, it makes it where there's like more competition, which will make it where there's more, uh, where, where there's more benefit ultimately for the consumers. That's kind of what I'm saying. Got it. And then in terms of Stellar, as you guys kind of build for that world, um, how many people do you guys have and kind of what is everyone focused on, right? In terms of um, the, the different bodies of work that you guys are, uh, are actively pursuing right now? Sure. Yeah. So we're about 80 people right now. Um, and we, we've, we've, we're focused on like several things. I mean, we kind of have like, uh, so the entity is Stellar Development Foundation, which was kind of the, the nonprofit that was set up to, to shepherd the Stellar network. Um, and so we do, we do a few things. Like we, we make sure that the, the core code base keeps getting maintained and like getting moved forward. And like I said, like works on things like scalability and all that kind of stuff. Um, the things, and then, and then we work on kind of on the policy side, like, you know, like weighing on things like the stable act, like you just mentioned and, and just making sure that, uh, legislator, uh, like regulators and legislators know, uh, understand what crypto is and understand what stellar is. And like, you know, they just need to be educated on it for the most part. And like, because it is this new complicated technology. And so just like helping that, that, that side of things. And then lastly, like helping on like kind of the ecosystem side with like, with, um, you know, uh, talking to partners and like introducing partners to each other, facilitating connections between them. Uh, one of the big things like that I mentioned earlier is that we're making this dollar savings app. It's called Vibrant. Um, it's mainly focused in Argentina. And the idea there is that, uh, you know, people in Argentina, they suffer like really high inflation. They can like convert their pesos into dollars and hold them in this app and they can send it, send it around with, with, amongst each other and things like that. So, um, so efforts like that, where we, we spend like, trying to make Stellar useful for real people in the world, right? So we have a, a, another one in, in uh, between Nigeria and Europe, there's like a big uh, B2B payments corridor going over Stellar that we're helping foster and like, you know, like contribute to. So things like that, where we just, we're trying to make this, this technology, like one hand we're like building the technology, but like a, a big part of the organization is just trying to make this actually useful for people, uh, which I think is, is kind of that focus. It seems a little bit neglected in the crypto industry in general to me. It's like, people get kind of enamored with the, how cool the technology is and, and like lose sight of like, how do we actually make it where this is useful for people? So we spend a lot of time on that. Everyone wants to show you what shiny thing they can do with the right. tech, but, yeah. uh, but, but yeah. the user doesn't necessarily care, of course. Yeah. Uh, before I let you go, I always ask the same two questions to everyone and then you'll get to ask me one to finish up. Uh, the first is, what is the most important book that you've ever read? Uh, and if you don't read a lot of books, you can say any piece of content. Sure. Uh, the most important book. I mean, there's a ton of really good books. Uh, um, I don't know. I mean, one of the ones that I think about a lot is this book, Beginning of Infinity by David Deutsch. Uh, it's, it's essentially, um, it's this very positive take on, 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 on human progress and, and knowledge. Essentially, it's, it's essentially like, uh, there's certain, there's certain ways of structuring things where they can kind of go infinite. Like if you look at the way like DNA is, for instance, like it's this cool code that allows you to build all these kind of different organisms. And uh, there's like similar things that happen with like, like with human language, like it's like a fixed set of letters, but you can make essentially infinite amounts of, of, of content with it. And uh, it's just, it's just a very interesting and cool book. So yeah, that's, that's one of my favorites. Second question is more fun. Aliens. Are you a believer or a non-believer? Uh, I, I don't know. I go back and forth. They used to be pretty convinced that they had to be there somewhere. The fact that we don't see them or haven't seen them in so long uh, makes me wonder if, if we are in fact alone, at least in kind of our light cone. Uh, but, um, I don't know if, if they are there, you know, I don't know. There's this other book called three body problem or series of this trilogy. 
And basically it's premise is that, that if there are aliens out in the world, uh, they essentially are all hiding because if any alien civilization sees another alien civilization, it, it really behooves them to just destroy that other civilization. So we kind of have to hide. Uh, so maybe that's what's going on too, which would be, which might be really bad for us because we, we're not hiding it. <laughs> but, but, uh, but yeah, so I don't know. It, it's, it's weird that we haven't seen them. I'm definitely in the camp of, uh, we don't want them to find us. We want to find them for sure. Uh, you could ask me one question to wrap up. What do you got for me? Well, you have a question. Yeah. Well, so yeah. What, what is, what's the most interesting thing that you've seen in the last year? Yeah. I mean, I I think the easy answer is Bitcoin, right? Just in terms of like that, that kind of has the capture, the hearts and minds of not only the retail side and kind of the everyday person, uh, but also the institution. Uh, but, I've changed a little bit in terms of, I had a guy who recently come on the podcast. He's uh, from Canada. Uh, he literally spent, uh, I don't know, he's like 32 years old or so. He spent the last 10, 12 years of his life uh, laying tile, doing construction, kind of just very you know manual type, what I would consider like the everyday person type jobs. Um, and he, I brought him on the podcast because he basically was like, look, you know, in 2016 or 17, he went over to a buddy's house. They were all drinking some beers, watching sports. Uh, and usually they're talking about their fantasy football teams and you know, all this nonsense. And somebody says something about crypto. And he was like, oh, you can get rich there? Cool. Like, you know, how do I get an account and what do I buy? Right. You know, kind of the the classic story. And he said what that set him off on, though, over the last three or four years was basically went down the rabbit hole. He started to learn about what is money, you know, financial uh, infrastructure, kind of monetary policy, um, all the financial inclusion stuff, like just all the things that I think once you've spent a lot of time looking at this stuff, you're like, hey, this stuff's important and I wish more people knew about it. Yeah. Uh, And so he said this one line to me that was just like really powerful. He was like, I'm not trying to take over the world. I'm just trying to provide a better life for my family. And I think that like we always forget because it's so cool to talk about, you know, JP Morgan's doing this or, you know, uh, this exchange just popped up and they're going to take down the New York stock exchange or, you know, this network's going to take out visa. And like, sure. A lot of that is going to happen, but we kind of forget about like that everyday person who literally is just like, I now feel better educated. And he's even went as far as to say, like, if all this fails and I lose all my money, uh, I still feel better off because I got educated during this process. And so yeah. uh, to me, like, we're now reaching the point where like, you're starting to have enough content in the space. You're starting to have enough information. You're starting to have enough people where you can see like a true impact on society. Um, and so it's kind of cool just to think about like, if that trend continues, you know, 20 years from now, 10 years from now, like, yeah, actually probably your, your kind of vision of like, you know, people in the developing world, like, yeah, actually a lot of them probably do interact with this stuff, right? Even in the developed world. Uh, and I think that ultimately like that's the interesting part, right? Or, or, or the, the part that I think we all hope happens. Um, yeah. but it takes, you know, work every day, like you guys are doing and others to, uh, to, to actually build the technology to make it happen. Yeah, no, it's pretty cool that, uh, I mean, one of the, one of the good benefits of, of this whole like crypto revolution, I guess, is that, that people, are starting to understand a lot more. Like basically it's like we're gonna pull back the curtain on how money works. Like you kind of just took it for granted beforehand, but now you're like, oh wait, this is this is what's going on back here. So it's, it's uh yeah, it's been pretty cool. In, in 2020, you know, they, they're basically in the United States running trillion dollar uh, marketing campaigns for, uh, hey, we could just like edit our bank account. Like, oh, okay. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I can't do that, right? So like, yeah. I, uh, the, n- nice that you guys can. Uh, cool. Where can we send people to find you on the internet uh, or find out more about Stellar? Sure. Yeah. Uh, I mean, our website stellar.org and our Reddit is pretty active. Uh, R Stellar. Um, I mean, my Twitter account, I, I never really use Twitter, but it's there if you want to <laughs> occasionally retweet them. Uh, just at Jed McCaleb. So, but yeah. That's me. Awesome, man. Well, listen, thank you so much for doing this. I think people will learn a lot and I'll have to do it again in the future. Yeah. Great talking to you.